Welcome to the CWA Radio Network. You're listening to Amusing, hosted by me, Heather Randall. What if every thought is deeper than a daydream? What if it's a seedling from our Heavenly Father, our one true muse, pointing us to something we need to know? Let's embrace the freedom to wonder, take the invitation to explore, and learn everything he has to teach us in this amazing journey of life. Let's get this show started. Hello and happy Friday. You're listening to episode 22 of Amusing. It's good to be back and I'm excited to dive into this new series that I briefly teased in my last episode. I don't know how long this series will take or what God is doing with it. I'm going to do what I always do with this show. I'm going to listen and follow his lead. Through this study, we're going to be exploring scripture and history, looking for people who faced obstacles and paradigm changes that altered their course and redefined their mission or destiny. Think about planning to go in one direction, having your life totally mapped out, and then something unexpected happens, and it all tilts. Everything dulls and doors close. All the arrows suddenly point away from the dream destination. And you have to scramble or shift or be pliable because your life is taking an unexpected turn. It was 2005, and I was pregnant with my third child. My oldest was in the hospital with severe dehydration after a virus, possibly the flu, I don't really remember. I remember lying on the cot in the hospital room after she'd fallen asleep. I dozed off too, and I dreamt of the child in my womb. I saw an enormous bird with an injured wing, and I watched my then unborn child, who I recognized without really seeing, wrap the bird in gauzes of many colors, healing it until it flew away. The colors of the gauze changed the color of the bird, even after the gauze was removed. This healed bird was glorious and colorful and stunning in the sky as it rose off the ground, I asked questions in the dream about my baby's future. In the dream, I knew I was seeing with spiritual eyes and that God was showing me prophetically who my child would be. I was answered in the dark. I was told she would help to heal broken hearts. Healing was such a strong message of the dream, and I remember knowing or being told that Isaiah 40, verse 31, was to be her life verse. It reads, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I felt from that day that I needed to nurture her and steer her in this direction. I've had hunches about my children's gifts and their bent and how to guide them. But this felt so incredibly strong. I can't help but take my role seriously. I feel responsible for ensuring that she accepts and embraces her calling to heal and bind up the brokenhearted. There are a million ways that she could do this, of course. Professionally, spiritually through prayer, by imparting laughter and joy into people's life when they are down in the dumps. There's really no parameter or boundary or concrete path for her that I've been shown. But the feeling that she must bring healing is without a doubt certain for me. I've told her about the dream. I've taught her about physical and spiritual healing, equipped her with a meaningful prayer life, and taught her to seek God's voice. However, she is the one who has to decide. She has to obey the call. She has to accept the mission. And that can be hard for anyone, much less a kid. Let's face it. She has her own idea of who she wants to be. How can she just ignore those interests? Would doing so make her less her? Less authentic? Can she have both? Can she have it all? Let me tell you about a young boy from Italy who wanted to be a painter. His father was an artist in his own right, a musician, one you would expect would accept his son's interests and value his education in the arts. The boy was friends with artists and critics and privy to the world of Renaissance art and the Tuscan way. He had ends with this capricious industry, tutors and influences and future patrons, if you will. He could make this dream of being a painter work. He knew how to see with an artist's eye. 
He could sketch with mathematical precision. He could move color with a clear understanding of spectrum and light. He could be a success. However, his path to artistic greatness was redirected by his father, who preferred for him to study medicine instead. Now, medicine was not art. This was not the dream, not the path that this young man had envisioned for himself. But he did something that many modern children would resist doing. He obeyed. He went to medical school. There at medical school, he fell in love with math and was so convincing in his devotion to it that he succeeded in swaying his father to let him study mathematics and natural philosophy instead of medicine. The study of astronomy was included in his study of mathematics and applied science at the time, and it opened up for him a world and a destiny that none could predict. Who am I speaking of? Galileo. Galileo would have very likely made a fabulous artist. His sketches of the moon are noteworthy and skilled. But did the world really need another Lodovico Cigoli? Could we have lived without Galileo's contributions? By obeying his father and embracing studies he wasn't initially drawn to, unexpected interests were woken. Vision was given. Galileo became something no one could have predicted. He recognized as his, he, he's recognized today as the father of modern science, the father of observational astronomy. He provided the framework for the theory of relativity, invented an early thermometer, improved the military compass, pioneered the scientific method, noted the largest of the moons of Jupiter and the phases of Venus, recognized sunspots on the moon, discovered evidence of Earth's rotation, improved the telescope, enhanced knowledge regarding the laws of motion, and so much more. Galileo said, you cannot teach a man anything. You can only help him find it within himself. Was the shift of path, this forced redirection, the thing that enabled him to see inside himself a potential he didn't know existed. Sometimes we are the most us, the most authentic and truly original, when we're placed where we don't want to be, pushed out of our comfort zones, forced to see things new. Sometimes trials and obstacles and tilted dreams can be the catalysts that propel us into our God-given giftings. Let me tell you about another boy. He was trained as a carpenter by his father. You know who I'm speaking of. Jesus knew who he was from a young age, and his path was stalled many times. His time hadn't come, and then it did. At 33, he was well acquainted with his purpose. He knew his destiny wasn't to be a carpenter. He knew, he always knew, that he would die. But in the garden, we see a picture of a man with dreams and an, and an identity and a love of life that he didn't want to lose. He wanted in that moment to continue. He wanted to remain in his flesh, leading his ragtag crew of believers, teaching them in the wilderness, eating with, with them in the quiet rooms. He wanted to touch the lost, the hurting, the dying, and make them whole. He wanted to experience friendships and family bonds and even heartbreak. He wanted to breathe and keep breathing forever. He wanted to live. He wasn't just saying, Dad, do I have to, like Galileo likely was when his course was changed. Jesus was literally crying blood. Let's read Luke 22, verse 41 through 44. It says, He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. I don't know about you, but I can't read Jesus' prayer as a common sentence. Simple dialogue read quickly, short and sweet. Maybe it was easily spoken, pure and unbroken, but I read it with pauses and delays 
and anguish and vast subtext between every word. I hear the ache and recognize the heartbreak of surrender that seems almost tangible in these passages. It wasn't easy to obey his father. It wasn't easy to lay down his life, but he did. Jesus knew the character of God. They were and are one. He knew the necessity of the sacrifice, the impact it would have on you and I. Romans 5.19, let me say this again, Romans 5.19 stresses the aspect of Jesus' obedience in this situation. It reads, for just as through the disobedience of one, the man, it reads, for just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Remember, Adam had to be dead to a tree to not eat its fruit. He could see it, acknowledge its presence, even touch it. Eve's claim in Genesis 3.3 that God said they couldn't touch it was an exaggeration and not God's actual words. They were simply instructed by God not to partake from it. In contrast, Jesus had to die on a tree. He had to taste death and experience evil of the most brutal kind. Obedience is hard. And though we don't have to die for the sins of the world as Jesus did, our compliance to God's will will have an effect on it, and even if it's only on a personal level. Galileo had to decide to obey his father. In a similar way, my daughter will have to choose to obey my husband and I as we strive to follow God's voice in our parenting and to keep her on the path that she's meant for. As I said, I'd be talking about overcoming obstacles. You probably didn't expect a lesson on obedience. The truth is, obedience can become a major core-shifting, life-altering obstacle for some. Free will is a massive risk. It leaves us open to choose or reject our purpose, based solely on impulse and appetite. Obedience requires trust, And trust, too, can be an obstacle that keeps many people stuck. You have to believe that the authority over you wants good things for you and has honest motivation to see you thrive. You have to assume that the authority is discerning, seeing something you can't or knowing something you don't, that the authority's insight into you is sincere and that trusting their guidance, even to the point of rejecting your own wild instincts, will prove worth it. In 2 Corinthians 10.5, Paul is defending his ministry to the people and warning them that obedience to God is crucial. If they obey God, then they're going to respect him. Paul knows this. So he writes, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Every thought has to be taken captive. Even the dreams and goals that we have for ourselves. Every picture we put in our minds, every goal, every hope, has to be captured like a prisoner and submitted to God. If he is willing that it should be, then it will happen. If it is not his will, we as believers must be willing to lay it down. There is no middle ground. Only he can give the green light. Of course, I want what is best for my daughter. My heart is to see her live fully, to glorify God in the way that he has determined, and to take joy in her purpose. I don't have a selfish motivation for her to be any one thing, but I do feel an enormous responsibility to fulfill the mission of training her in the way that she should go. That requires a sort of obedience from me as I listen to God and let him guide my parenting. Let me explain it this way. I'm teaching my oldest to drive. I'm her teacher and the responsible person in her car. I have to direct and correct her and make her steer the car safely and stay on the road. But I didn't make the road. 
I didn't make the laws she has to obey as a driver. I too am subject to the authority of the law, and by that I am limited in what I can allow her to do. I can't direct her to drive 90 miles an hour through our neighborhood. I can't allow her to take a shortcut across someone's yard. But I can tell her to drive to the store and suggest the safest route. I imagine Galileo's dad had pure reasons for wanting him to set aside art to pursue medicine. I don't believe it was selfishly motivated or a corrupt longing. I think he saw something in his child that needed to be brought to light and explored. He was firm in it for a reason. And later, when Galileo had asked his father for his blessing to switch to mathematics, his dad bent for a reason. The trick as a parent is learning when to say yes and when to say no. And the only way I can find any confidence in either is to seek God. I ask him how to answer my children all the time. If my prayer life was a text message, these words would always be found in my predictive text. Sometimes God will say no to one thing and yes to another. He'll hold us back in one desire and let us free on something else. God knows what's good for us, so he understands when to be firm and when to bend. He knows us. He's the perfect parent, a good father. 1 Peter 1, 14-15 says, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. What is an evil desire? Well, what is sin? It's the act of missing the mark, falling short of God's design and plan. An evil desire doesn't have to seem bad. Proverbs 14.12 says, There is a way that appears to to be right, but in the end it leads to death. An evil desire can be that thing you want to do that isn't good for you, the thing that will take you off the course of groundbreaking discovery and land you in the place of mediocrity. An evil desire might look good, even fun, like being an artist instead of profoundly influencing every branch of mathematics and science. It might even be good. It might hit the target but miss the bullseye. Is that what we want? Enough when we can have excellence? Good rather than best? We're told in 1 Peter 1.15 to be holy. So how do you achieve holiness? Let me explain it this way. Holiness is simply faith applied through obedience and demonstrated by doing the right things. A notable fact is that Galileo did end up having an impact on the art scene after all. His influence is seen in the works of established artists of his day. If that wasn't enough, a first edition of Starry Messenger, a pamphlet written by Galileo featuring his scientific work related to the telescope, as well as some sketches of the moon, sold at auction in 2010 for a whopping $662,000 in Let me say that number again. $662,500. Don't forget that extra $500. Not bad for a guy who didn't get to be an artist, right? You see, when you surrender your dreams, God often rewards you. Do you have the faith that God is in charge? That he's instructed your authorities and knows exactly where and who you are meant to be? Do you believe that he has a good plan for you and has the safest, best route mapped out for you? Are you willing to demonstrate this faith by obeying the instructions you're given by your parents or whoever your authority is, thereby ultimately obeying God? Are you willing to choose not just the good thing, the fun thing, the easy thing, but to embark on on an adventure that is certain to stretch you to break you and rebuild you until you are unrecognizable, until you are completely conformed to the will of God and impacting your world in concrete, unmistakable ways? 
Are you willing to be holy through your whole, complete, unreserved surrender? If so, you've conquered one obstacle. Join me next week as we face another.